Hey everyone, Minutia Minute here, and welcome to Murder Week. Um, as I continue through my 365 movie challenge, I'm going to be looking to come up with some creative marathons as I go through. Um, every week, I'm going to be trying to focus on some kind of a topic or a series that I can just really dig into over the course of the week. This week, I decided to focus on murder on film, which is a super broad topic, um, but I thought it might be kind of fun to just do a cursory survey of films in which murder is central to the plot or the narrative. So I came up with seven different categories, picked a film for each category, and sat down and watched them all throughout the week. Now, obviously, there's a ton of different directions you could go with this. I racked my brain and came up with the following seven categories, but there are certainly many more out there. Be sure to leave comments and thoughts down below if there's any that you feel like I really should have covered, but these are the seven that I went with. I went with Crime of Passion, Murder for Hire, Manslaughter, Matricide slash Patricide, Serial Killers, Whodunits, and Eye for an Eye slash Revenge. I was able to get out and see one movie in theaters this week, and then I did allow myself one rewatch. It's not a new film, it's not a new release, but it's new to my collection. I was recently able to pick it up from Half Price Books, and since it's out of print, I was really excited to give it a watch. First time I'm seeing it in high definition. So, to get started, let's talk about the film I saw in theaters this week, and it fills the Crime of Passion category, and it was Ridley Scott's House of Gucci. Obviously, this came out around Thanksgiving of last year. It's been in theaters for quite a while, but it's had some decent legs to it. I would assume with the award seasons coming up, it'll probably stick around in theaters for a little while. I don't know what the nominations this year will look like, but it would not surprise me if this film gets a fair amount of buzz. Um, this is the story of the Gucci family at kind of the end of their reign over the Gucci brand. Um, it stars Adam Driver, Lady Gaga, Al Pacino, Jared Leto, tons of other people. Um, really an all-star cast on this one. I can't remember for sure, but I'm pretty sure when I talked about Nightmare Alley, I kind of dissed A Star is Born and that I wasn't really interested in going back to it. But now, having seen Bradley Cooper in <laughs> Nightmare Alley and how good of a job he did, and then seeing Lady Gaga in this, I'm kind of tempted to go back and check it out because she gives the most incredible performance in this movie. Seeing her character kind of deteriorate throughout the film was really interesting to watch. And even as she goes off the deep end, she's still very relatable, albeit obviously very flawed. Um, Adam Driver in this movie, as always, is fantastic. Adam Driver is probably my favorite actor working in Hollywood today. I will watch anything with him in it. Now, obviously, the two leads are going to get all the attention and all the love, but I really want to give a special shout-out to Al Pacino in this because he's someone who, you know, is kind of a caricature of himself sometimes. Like, you know, it's that persona that Al Pacino exudes. Even in his best movies, like Heat... Uh, you get those Al Pacinoisms that can almost take you out of the movie even. And in this movie, even though he's just playing a supporting role, it was really cool to see his return to form. Like, I really felt like he gave some of his best work in this movie. Um, he does have kind of one Pacino-style outburst towards the end. Um, but he's a really interesting character, very flawed and very vulnerable, which is not something you see in your typical run-of-the-mill Pacino role. As far as the direction goes, it's just really cool to see Ridley Scott, now in his mid-80s, still putting out some of his best work. Um, it's just mind-blowing, actually, to see. Uh, I haven't had the chance to see The Last Duel yet, but it's on my list, and I'm really excited to check it out. I've heard it's amazing. And he does great work in this movie, too. This film, kind of like American Gangster, actually is played fairly reserved. It's a much more clinical approach than you see Ridley Scott take in other work that he's done. My one complaint about the movie, which is also actually kind of similar to American Gangster, is that the movie just kind of ends. <laughs> just kind of out of nowhere. Uh, American Gangster has a whole lot of rising action, you're really invested in the characters, and eventually they just kind of run out of story. Uh, Denzel Washington turns state's evidence, 
and then all of a sudden you find out what happened to everybody in sort of the ending titles. Uh, very similar in House of Gucci, where there's just not a lot of room for denouement in this. All right, next up was my Murder for Hire film. Um, plenty of movies out there about assassins. One that's been on my list forever. I've had it sitting in my Criterion collection since, I want to say, last year. Is Le Samurai. Um, I have never seen a Jean-Pierre Melville film, and this was the one I was always the most interested in checking out. I'll definitely be checking out more of them. Uh, shame on me for not having watched this movie before. Uh, easily the best film I watched this week. This film tells the story of a hired hitman and an assassination that ultimately goes wrong. Um, this is steeped in noir tropes, famously so. Um, just a beautiful movie to look at, very interesting characters, and incredibly tense throughout. There's so much methodology. The killer's plan, how he executes it, how he executes his getaways. There's almost a quaintness to it because of the fact that the film was made in the 1960s and is dealing with the technology of the day, but it's so methodically laid out that you can easily follow it and you immediately get invested because so much of the tension comes from just watching him execute these tasks. There's a scene at the beginning of the film where he's jacking a car and he just has a whole ring of keys and he's just going through them one by one until he gets to the key that will start the vehicle. And at the beginning of the film it's kind of quaint but then you get halfway through the film and he's on the run and there are police officers everywhere and he goes through that same process again and you're just on the edge of your seat the whole way and even if you have no context for what it was like jacking a car in the 1960s the film does such a great job of setting it up and paying it off you're completely immersed and along for the ride so yeah i mean there's only so much i can say about this movie because it's all already been said before if you've never seen it Go check out Le Samurai. Okay, next up is the film about manslaughter, which turned out to be way more than I expected. <laughs> um, I had never seen very bad things. All I knew was it was about a bunch of guys and their, their bachelor party in Vegas and them accidentally killing a prostitute while they're in town. Um, now, there are a lot of other murders that happen along the way after that that maybe would take away from this film as a manslaughter movie. But these are the perils of picking movies you haven't seen when you're digging into a category. So it is what it is. This was an interesting watch. Uh, you know, it's a fairly famous cult black comedy. Um, the interesting thing to me about it is I actually didn't think it was funny really at all. <laughs> It's one of those things where it's funny in premise, but once you get into the meat and potatoes of the movie, the way Peter Berg directs this film is so grounded. Uh, the characters are very real. Everyone is kind of talking over the top of each other throughout the film, which adds to the sort of realism of it. And so when they're in these absurd moments, even though they're absurd, they seem very real. Probably the funniest part of the film is Cameron Diaz's character. Um, as things unfold, she sort of plays the stereotypical bridezilla, but her role is really the only one that's truly played to absurdity. Everyone else is pretty grounded. Um, this has got a great cast in it. Again, Christian Slater, Cameron Diaz, Jeremy Piven, Daniel Stern, who's one of my all-time favorites, John Favreau, and they all give great, great performances throughout the course of the film. So if you've never seen Very Bad Things, I do recommend checking it out. Uh, one of the most insane kills happens in this movie about halfway through. I wouldn't want to spoil it, um, but it's absolutely jarring. Um, I was reminded of the moment in Meet Joe Black when Brad Pitt gets hit by a car, um, which at the time was super startling because you'd never seen anything like it because of the CGI involved in creating that moment. Um, Very Bad Things has a similar moment that's equally shocking, but it's all done practically and through great editing. So even though I didn't really find this movie funny, um, I, did, I did actually really like it. Next up was my rewatch of the week. 
And this I picked up used from Half Price Books. I was super excited to find it because I hadn't seen it in many, many years. I don't think it's actually in print anymore, but I did find a copy of Throw Mama from the Train. What a fun movie to revisit. If you've never seen Throw Mama from the Train, I can't recommend it enough. I think it's one of those that a lot of people have seen it, although since it's not as readily available anymore, I would assume younger audiences probably aren't quite as familiar with it. Um, but basically the premise of this is Billy Crystal is Danny DeVito's creative writing teacher. And he's trying to explain to him why the murder mystery he's written isn't landing. Um, so he starts talking to him about Hitchcock. Danny DeVito goes to see Strangers on a Train, in which two strangers meet on a train and agree to kill the respective problem in each other's lives because they'll have a perfect alibi. Now it just so happens Billy Crystal and Danny DeVito both have people that they wish were dead. Danny DeVito assumes Billy Crystal is sending him a subtle message and allegedly kills Billy Crystal's problem and then approaches Billy Crystal insisting that he kill his mother and the whole film centers around Billy Crystal trying to navigate potentially killing Danny DeVito's mother. Unfortunately, I don't know this actress's name, but she is absolutely amazing in Throw Mama from the Train. Not only is she really funny, but she's also very convincing as a dependent elderly person in the care of Danny DeVito. If you're someone who's a creative person and you've ever felt writer's block, this is a movie you're going to relate to. What Billy Crystal goes through while he's trying to help Danny DeVito in his creative writing class create their work, while experiencing writer's block of his own is absolutely priceless. The night was moist. Or was it sultry? Alright, next up is a film about a serial killer. This ended up being my third black comedy in a row. I didn't realize I had gone so heavily in that direction. But um, ultimately, this movie was probably the biggest disappointment of the week. The crux of the film is Ryan Reynolds is basically someone with a serial killer's pathology He's taking medication, but stops. His pets start talking to him. He has an evil cat and a good dog. And they're basically like the two angels on his shoulder throughout the movie. What's interesting about the movie is you always see the town he works in, the factory he works at, and his apartment all through the perspective of what he sees when he's not on his medication, which is far away from what the real life image of it is. There's a point where he gets back on his meds and you get a glimpse of just how awful the world he's living in is and how horrific it is, but it's only a small portion of the world that you've seen. And so it's kind of disappointing not to see the rest of the town and the factory he's working at because the whole film has this sort of sitcom shiny quality to it. And you know it's not what's going on in real life, but you never get the satisfaction of actually finding out what that world was like. I think even though Ryan Reynolds really isn't my favorite actor, um, he does do a good job with the material he's given in this. Um, it definitely feels like a film where Ryan Reynolds is trying to take a more serious turn. And this was the best they could come up with to fit within the Ryan Reynolds brand. Because ultimately... Either he didn't have enough confidence or the studio didn't have enough confidence that he could really go all the way in that Robin Williams one hour photo kind of way. This is another movie where, you know, there's a lot of rising action and then it just kind of comes to a conclusion because that's what needs to happen. I would have really liked to have seen more from the supporting cast of this film. Maybe get to spend some time with the local police through which you could have seen what the town was really like. Uh, in the third act. I think that something like that would have really helped kind of bolster the movie. As is, it just felt like they didn't know how to end it, and so they ended it kind of in the most lazy way possible. The final shot of the film is very somber, and then it cuts to the credits, and it's like a song and dance number, which is supposed to be, you know, black comedy funny haha, -ha, um, and really clashes with where the movie leaves you emotionally. It's really just there to remind you that, hey, this was supposed to be a comedy. <laughs> um, because, again, this film just didn't quite have an identity figured out for itself. And you can really tell. All right, penultimate film I watched this week was the Eye for an Eye Revenge Murder Story. And for that, I chose Terror in a Texas Town. 
Um, I have never seen this movie. I knew almost nothing about it when I picked it up. I was just kind of in a Western mood. I recently heard Comic Crack talking about Sterling Hayden, which kind of put it back on my radar and I pulled it off the shelf. And wow, this is an incredible movie. Um, in a lot of ways, this is sort of a soft remake of High Noon, at least thematically. Uh, you have a very similar plot in which, you know, the town is silent, unwilling to take action against the big bad that's ruining their lives. So very similar to High Noon. There's also a very clear commentary on the blacklist in Hollywood and all the things that went along with that, also similar to High Noon. Uh, this is written by Dalton Trumbo, who was blacklisted. The villain of the piece, who actually is one of the best sort of man in black western characters I can think of that I've ever seen, I thought he absolutely chewed the scenery to perfection, uh, was someone who was blacklisted in Hollywood. This was one of his first movies after some of the hysteria had kind of subsided. Uh, which made for a really interesting dynamic because Sterling Hayden, who's the hero of the film, uh, is famous for being someone who named names when he was asked to name names. And so there's a really great tension between these two characters that's sort of oddly reversed because the blacklisted man is the villain and the person who named names is the hero of the film rising above what he actually did in real life. Just a super, super interesting casting choice. It might be blasphemy to say this, but I would say I actually prefer this movie to High Noon. Maybe just because I'm so familiar with that movie and there's you know so much that's been made of that movie over time. Um, but there's just a little bit more complexity to this, I think. I thought the performances overall were better. The allegory going on is similarly obvious, but also a bit more complex. Um, all the major heroes in this film are foreigners, which is interesting. Sterling Hayden plays a Swedish whaler, which is not something I've ever seen in a Western before. Uh, he has some friends that are Mexicans. And having all of these characters that are sort of intended to be first-generation Americans creates a really interesting dynamism to the cast that is not present in High Noon. There's a brilliant line early in the movie in which... The sheriff of the town, when Sterling Hayden is complaining about all the wrongdoings going on there and how his land is being stolen, uh, the sheriff says, this is America where you actually have rights, and then proceeds to explain to him that he doesn't actually have any rights and he should just get out of town. And it's this wonderful contradiction that really sums up America in a, in a lot of ways. The ideal of America versus what America actually is a lot of the time for a lot of people. So, um, huge recommendation on Terror in a Texas Town for me. A little bit different than a lot of other westerns that you've maybe seen from this period, while still holding to a lot of those classic western programmer tropes. All right, finishing out the week is kind of an oddball, uh, but it's my Who Done It, and I actually had to break out the VCR to watch this one, and uh, it's the movie Stunts. Um, I don't know how familiar people are with this movie anymore, um, but I wanted to watch this and I found it on VHS a while ago. I first became familiar with this movie because it's the first original film produced by Robert Shea. Um, this is a New Line Cinema release. Back in the day they used to basically just re-release foreign films and release independent films that weren't actually made by their studio, a la Street Fighter, which I watched last week. Um, and Stunts is, I believe, New Line Cinema's first effort at an original film, but definitely Robert Shea's first effort at an original film. And so I thought it would be interesting to go back and see kind of where old school New Line Cinema really started to get rolling. Uh, this film, I think, is from 1977 or 78, so just a couple years after the Street Fighter boom. It tells the story of a group of stuntmen. And basically there's someone on their movie set that is sabotaging the different stunts to kill off the stunt players. Uh, we don't really understand why until the very end when the killer is finally revealed. Honestly, this is barely a whodunit. <laughs> um, it technically counts because you got the man with the black gloves, you know, sabotaging various stunts. And you have people dying off one by one. There's one lone stuntman that joins the production whose brother was killed early on. And he's investigating to find out who's really behind it all. The main draw of this movie, though, is the stunt work itself. Because the whole film revolves around a series of stunts on a movie set. And since there's no plot 
really tied to the stunts. They could do any combination of stunts that they wanted that they thought would be spectacular for the camera. Um, and there's an added layer of complexity to them because it's not just a stunt you're watching on screen. It's a stunt you're watching someone else film on screen, which makes for some really fun, kind of awe-inspiring stunt work. Uh, this isn't necessarily the best movie ever uh, by any means. Uh, it's got a decent cast. It's got Robert Forster and Joanna Cassidy in it. But even though it's kind of a pot boiler, it wasn't a boring movie because it's just fun seeing the different creative setups that they have. Uh, there's a great sequence where a guy is on a car and he gets picked up by a helicopter and then he flies off. Uh, think Super Cop, think Mission Impossible Fallout, um, but in a much more low budget 1970s New Line Cinema kind of way. I'm not going to recommend it over Very Bad Things. I'm not going to recommend it over Terror in a Texas Town. I'm definitely not going to recommend it over Le Samurai. However, it is worth watching. Like, if you're someone who watches low-budget, kind of trash cinema, uh, this is pretty solid. Like, it really isn't bad. Definitely worth the 90 minutes if you get the chance to check it out. So with that, I hope you guys enjoyed my recap of week three of my 365 movie challenge. Thank you guys for watching. Give a thumbs up, and I hope you guys have a great week in movies.